chapter. I'll be uh, back in Matthew in chapter 19. Uh, but I want to take a, a, a brief uh, hiatus from Matthew today because I want to talk about small group ministry. Every year we train leaders, and we just finished training another series of leaders uh, about uh, three, two weeks ago, or I guess a week ago we finished our seven-week training course. We're launching a whole new series of groups for our church, which we do every year and every semester, and uh, we're really excited about this uh, semester as we are every semester, and I want to teach on it because I think it, uh, it's important to understand the value of small group ministry. Uh, our church uh, believes in them. We, uh, we practice not only corporate ministry like this, but we practice one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one ministry through discipleship, but also small group ministry. So I want to read the text of, of Acts, which is kind of the template for the New Testament church and tells us, in essence, how to do church in many respects. So in the book of Acts, chapter 2, this is following the, uh, the, the great sermon that Peter, Peter preached uh, and that many of the people that were those that crucified Christ and were there witnessing the crucifixion of Christ, they were preached to. They heard the gospel. And Peter said, repent, because you are the ones that hung Jesus on the cross. You killed the author of life. And the Bible says they were cut to the heart, and they said, what should we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And so 3,000 people came to Christ on that day. And as we learned uh, last week or the week before, I can't remember, that that was the answer to Jesus' prayer in Luke 23, verse 34, when he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And on 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached the message, and it says all of those that were there were those that were cruci crucifiers of Christ or witnesses, and they came to a saving knowledge of Christ when they repented of their sin. And what a day it was. The Bible tells us that the next day, uh, that the, the church had grown to 5,000 people. Amazing uh, growth that was taking place in the church. And the question was, how was the church going to accommodate all of these new believers? That's a lot of people. So that's what we're going to talk about today. The church has kind of been described as a, as a two-winged bird. And of course, you know, uh, for a bird to fly, they need two wings. And, uh, and the church needs two wings to fly as well. And the two wings of the church as it relates to th this kind of ministry is the corporate worship, the large gathering like we're having today, but also the small group setting where so many things can happen that can't happen in the large group setting. They, they are not in competition with each other. They actually are a beautiful blend of the complete work of God in the church and how he works through the church. And so this text that we're looking at today describes that. And so let's pick the verse up in uh, verse 40, uh, or actually 42 of chapter 2 of Acts. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Father, we thank you for the text of your scriptures, Lord, and we, we just thank you for everything, God. It's just amazing what you're doing. And as we're sharing the gospel with so many people this weekend, it's a reminder to us of the incredible privilege, the incredible wonder of the cross and of the resurrection and of the call that you give every man and woman to repent and to be baptized and to have a new relationship with Christ and to be born again. God, all of these things are, are astonishing to us. And Telling others is a reminder to us of this great work. And I pray as we consider small group ministry and, and how to embrace these people that are getting saved and others that will visit this church, Lord, and do visit this church, and those that are even here today, I pray that you would teach us and instruct us and that the answer from our heart, based on what your word teaches us, would be yes already. God, that we would just say yes. Our heart would be eager to do your will. May your name be glorified in your people, God as we walk with Christ and live for your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. It's interesting that um, there's such a hunger uh, for God. The, one of the lies of the enemy is that people don't really want to hear the gospel, that we live in a post-Christian age, that people are kind of past that, that it's not satisfying. 
uh, that, uh, that somehow the message of the gospel is old and uninteresting. And that's an absolute lie from hell. Because as I said, and we're witnessing it here just at Farm Fair, if we present the gospel clearly and simply for people with the love of Christ, people respond. That's just the way it is. People are hungry. They want to know God. And many people are even interested in coming to church. And there's some of you that are coming to church for the first time in a long time today. And maybe some of you for the very first time. And they've done a lot of research on, on church. And what they've discovered is that, that 85% of the people that come to churches, I'm talking about nationally, they come to churches. I'm going to keep talking and I hope you can hear me. Uh, when they come to church, 85% of those people will not be in church the following year. That's not very good. So you've got people who are hungry, they're interested, the Spirit's prompting them, they're being invited by people, but a year later, they're not coming to church. And yet they also did a study and they found out why. The major reason why people stop coming is that they don't develop any meaningful relationships in the church during their visits. I don't know about you, I've been to churches where I, I walk into the to the parking lot, and I'm like, you know how our church is, we're like, I'm saying hi to everybody. I'm meeting the people out of the cars, I'm meeting the the greeters and everything, and it's like, but Becky and I have been to churches where we go through all of that, and we're waving to everybody, talking to everybody, because that's just what we do, and no one says hi to us. It's the strangest thing, and you walk in, and you walk out of the service, and you almost feel like you weren't supposed to be there, like you didn't belong, and that is such a travesty, because when somebody takes the risk to come into the church, I was going to say through the doors of the church, but that's not really true for every church, I guess, uh, <laughs> But when you come into church, everyone should be, it should be a party that, you know, that the person has come to. It's like, we're so glad you're here. We're so thankful that the Lord brought you. You matter. You count. And we want your friendship. We want to be connected with you. That really is the mark of the church, is that the, the love of Christ is just overflowing in the fellowship of the saints. And so in more, more research they did, this is what they discovered. They, it said 90% of new people would stay in the church if three things were offered to them. Three things. Number one, if in the time that they visit, and people usually will try a church for three times or so, and then they're going to make their decision, if in that time frame they can connect with four or five or six people and develop a nice little friendship with them, that makes a difference. That makes a total difference. That's why some of you, when you come to church, you're looking for people you know. You know, you're looking for a familiar face, somebody from the community. And a lot of, because we got such a, a, a range of people in our church and such a mix of people, uh, it's a pretty good chance you're going to find somebody you know in our church when you visit this church. And so that connection makes a big difference. The second thing that they discovered is that if they get involved in some sort of a small group fairly quickly uh, upon coming to the church it's a pretty good chance that they're going to keep going to that church. And these are all relational issues. The third one is interesting because it's not relationship-based. The third one is that if a person can learn how to articulate their faith, they'll stay in that church. Isn't that interesting? That's kind of like an out from left field. Well, I guess that would be out from left field. <laughs> you know, but the, two are, the first two are relationship-based. If they can make a connection and if they can be in a small group, and, and the third one is if they can learn how to articulate their faith. And what, what it's really saying is that people want to know what they believe. They want to have a solid foundation. In other words, they want to be taught the Word of God. They want to have a firm faith. And that's exactly what should happen in a church, is the saints are trained and equipped for the work of the ministry. And so these are the things that, uh, that people are really looking for, which is why uh, the small group ministry in, in our church, in your church, any church that people are a part of, is so absolutely important. Now, if you're following along in your notes, you can, uh, you can fill these little blanks in or you can just listen. But the biblical foundation of small groups is really modeled for us by the example of the New Testament church. And we see that in the text that we read today. They had exponential growth, 3,000 people coming to Christ on the day of Pentecost in a single day, 5,000 uh, the next day, the numbers grew to. Now, keep in mind, that's just the men. That doesn't include the women and children. So we could be talking somewhere between, it's not likely that it's 15,000 people. It's more like 30,000 or 40 or 50,000 people within the first few days of the church being birthed. Now, let me ask you a question. If suddenly you had 30,000 people come to Christ, what in the world would you do to take care of those people? That's the, that's the big, 
you know, million dollar question. It's like nobody asked that question. What did these guys do? Twelve apostles, and then you've got the followers of Christ, many of whom already left Christ after his uh, command that they'd have to, you know, uh, basically give everything up to follow Christ. A lot of those left. So maybe we're left with 250 followers of Christ at this point on the day of Pentecost, plus the disciples, trying to manage a massive number of people. Historians tell us that, uh, that the early church within the first few years was up to 100,000 people uh, in just in that small region of Jerusalem. So the question is, what do you do with that many people and how do you possibly service that many people and help them grow? and not just be a number in some massive setting. They didn't even have places to meet that were large enough to accommodate that many people. And so the text of Scripture tells us that they were meeting in the synagogues, but they were also meeting from house to house. I mean, they were just like, it, it's like a roving, you know, I don't know, what do you call that when you have a dinner party and, and you go from house to house for the different parts of the party? A progressive dinner. It's like a progressive worship experience. And you go to this person's house and you're worshiping there. And then let's go over to their house. And you go over to their house and you're worshiping. And they're just doing this every day, the Bible tells us. They're still doing their work. They're still taking care of their families. But they are so enthused about this transformation of their life because of the risen Christ and the gospel that they just can't get enough. And so they're going from house to house. It tells us what they're doing. They're... Uh, uh, they're devoting themselves to four things, the apostles' teaching. So we know that the teaching of the Word of God is paramount. It's really important that that's a component of small group ministry. We also know that they were uh, devoting themselves to fellowship. This is the deep connection of transparent, humble, uh, loving care for one another uh, that may not have been a part of your upbringing. It wasn't really, that's not really my upbringing. It may have been your upbringing. I had some of that. Some of you had more than I had, and a lot of you had a lot less. But whatever your upbringing is, what the church is offering and what God is offering through the church is this incredible connection of meaningful relationships that we've always wanted, always longed for, but not always really experienced. And the church was experiencing that. It's called koinonia. It's this care, this love, this camaraderie, this oneness, this united front of men and women that have a bond that's so powerful and life-changing that we really become a part of the family of God. The third thing they were doing was breaking bread. I don't need to t teach this church about eating. Uh, we've got that so wired. I, I was telling the guys um, when they came to uh, the men's, last men's group, and we have another one coming up, by the way. I think it's September 7th. Is that right, Dana? The 8th. Uh, we're having a big stakeout for the men to launch our next series for the men's group. You don't want to miss that. It's like, a, it's like a protein extravaganza. I mean, seriously, we got maybe a couple of little salads over there, but it's just all protein. The whole table is just filled with protein. It's awesome, and it smells like men. It's really great. Uh, so you want to you make sure you come to that. But when, when we were having our Ohana leaders training, and we had, uh, we had a potluck dinner uh, every, every night for that, that we had that at seven weeks, and then we had our last party, which was really uh, terrific. I was telling everybody, that you can't get a plate like this in Kapav anywhere. You know, I mean, it had so many different things, and everything was absolutely delicious. It'd be like 15 bucks if you could buy it. But you can't because it doesn't exist, <laughs> except in the church. And it's not just the food. It's the fellowship around communion, the body and the blood of Christ, the memorial. And the church was doing that. They also were committed to prayer. A, it's just a great place to pray in a small group. It's non-threatening. You can experiment. You can try. We, we had so many people praying at Farm Fair. I got to tell you a quick story. Um, I was doing the Evangel Cube. I can't tell you what it is if you don't know what it is, but it's a little cube. It's almost like a Rubik's Cube, but it, it shares the gospel. So I'm sharing it with all these kids that are in line. And these kids are, <laughs> I finished one batch and they'd receive Christ. And then, and then I'd start with a new batch that had kind of, and they're saying, Uncle, Uncle, tell us what the story is. So I'd be telling them the story. And this team over here would, would be horning in and trying to tell the story too because now they just learned it. And, and, and so I'm telling them about uh, the cross and how Jesus died on the cross. And then I show the tomb, and I say, and that's the end of the story. And the kids over here went ballistic. It's like, that's not the end of the story. Tell them about the sneaky stuff. Tell them the sneaky stuff that Jesus did. And I'm like, sneaky stuff? Yeah, he rose from the dead. I've never heard it described that way. <laughs> sneaky Jesus. That's one of the adjectives I just haven't ever found in the Bible, but there it is. But all of these little children are praying. 
And they're learning to pray, and the adults are learning to pray for the very first time. And that's what's happening in these small groups is you've got all these people that are praying. Many of them are not Jewish. Many of them are. But many of them are learning how to pray with just this openness that's, that's completely fresh and new. It's not rote. It's not memorized. It, it's just this awesome freedom in Christ to share our heart with our Lord and Savior. We have examples of how the disciples came upon this. They had a model. Uh, they weren't geniuses that thought this up, though these men were trained and, and scholarly. A lot of times the disciples take a lot of heat, but these were guys that memorized the Torah by the time they were bar mitzvahed at age 13. Uh, these were men were, were knowledgeable about scriptures. What does the scripture teach about how to take care of large numbers of people? God has a pattern throughout the Old Testament of breaking down large numbers of people, the Jewish people, into, into manageable sized groupings that can be cared for. And, and have people under-shepherd them like our chief shepherd shepherds us. And so we find that they were broken down in family units. We find that they were broken down by tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then we find that uh, even uh, in, in uh, the time of Moses, when they were in the wilderness wanderings in Exodus chapter 18, uh, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came to visit. You may remember this story. And Moses says, come on out, you know, Dad, I'm going to show you kind of what I do every day. And he goes and sits himself at the judgment seat outside the tent of meeting. And all the people bring all the, can you imagine millions of people? And they've got to have somebody, you know, untangle their problems. And so Moses is untangling problems. And the line stretches off forever, you know. And people are in the hot heat. They're, they're dehydrated. They're hungry. It's frustrating. Uh, but they have to patiently wait for Moses. And so Jethro comes along, and I think, I think Moses was probably expecting to be congratulated by his father-in-law and say, man, you are a hero. Wow, look at these people. They need you. This is amazing. I never thought I'd have a son-in-law so important. Instead, Jethro says, what you're doing is not good. What? What do you mean it's not good? Well, look at these people. They're not being, their needs aren't being met, and you're wearing yourself out. This isn't the right way to do it. And he said, you should put people in your leadership, you should develop leaders within the construct of the, the people of Israel that you trust and that have the Spirit of God in them. You should train them and raise them up and put some over a thousand people and some over a hundred and some over fifty and some over ten. And so the basic building block within the scriptures of care for a group of people is ten. And then you have somebody taking care of ten tens, which is a hundred. So they one person is taking care of 10 people and another people is person is taking care of 10 liters of tens and on it goes until you have somebody taking care of thousands. And so this is the model that they had in the Old Testament. So they knew right away what to do. They knew right away what to do. They trained people. They raised people up and they set them loose in the homes. You know, there are a lot of people in ministry that don't want people to be set loose. Everything has to be kind of controlled and managed from the top down. You have to use our material. You got to do it our way. Uh, we, you know, we need to have our hands on everything. There, there's a proper place for oversight, but there's a, there's a difference between oversight and micromanagement and, and just letting God lead his church and trusting the people of God to, to do a great job and to be inspired and then simultaneously to lead and to oversee and to care for the people who are actually under-shepherding the flock. And so we find in the New Testament that there were churches all over the place. We have the church in Jerusalem in Acts 5 and, and 12, the church in the house of Lydia in Acts 16, the church in the house of Priscilla and Aquila in Romans 16 and 1 Corinthians 16. We have the church of, of Philemon in Philemon's house in the book of Philemon. And of course, in Paul's travelings, he's frequently finding himself in private homes where they can only hold 15 people. These were very tiny homes they had. Uh, they didn't have three- and four-bedroom homes in these places. These were very tiny places. And so they could fit maybe five or 10 or 15 people, uh, and Paul would go preach, and the houses were overflowing, and people were listening from outside, and that was kind of, uh, kind of the experience that they had. So the early church had the temple worship, which was the corporate worship, but they also wanted more. And so they were going from house to house, and they were experiencing all of this incredible joy and fruitfulness and passion and excitement I call it the epic life. These two wings of the church were amazing and causing the church to soar. What's really interesting is that a couple of things changed that. One was persecution. That changed it. And what's interesting is it changed the corporate worship because no longer could the Christians go to the temple. They were being persecuted for being Christians. 
And so there was a great divide between Judaism and now these Jews who had received the gift of life and the Messiah. And so they weren't able to go to corporate worship, but that didn't put a hitch in the giddy up at all because they were already so infused with the passion and the love for the body of Christ in small group settings that they just went on without the large corporate setting. I want to share something with you that um, I'm not a prophet uh, in, in this respect in what I'm sharing with you, but, but I think it doesn't take a lot to envision the possibility the day may come when we can't worship corporately anymore in the United States. It seems ridiculous. If I'd said that to you maybe 10 years ago, you'd go, that's, you know, that's, I just can't even envision that. It's not hard to envision it now. It's not hard to see the possibility the day is going to come when, when I'm going to be jailed or sanctioned or told that if I preach the Bible or the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, that if I teach on uh, issues of uh, morality or ethics from the Bible, I will find myself in hot water and I'll have to make a decision and our church will have to make a decision whether we want to bend the knee to the government or to Christ. And we're going to bend the knee to Christ. And so it's really important that we are a church that's not corporate worship dependent, but we have the ability and we've got the leadership structure, which we do in this church, to, to cross this whole island and have small group ministry with very competent men leading, teaching, and women teaching and leading. And that's a, that's a reality that we need to be prepared for, is that we may not, uh, even in our lifetime, should the Lord tarry, have the privilege of corporate worship. It certainly wouldn't be the first time it's happened. It happened to the early church within the first uh, few years of, of, uh, of the birth of the church. So the, the question is, how did we get to the point now where big church is so important and small groups are kind of a sideline? Well, it's interesting because it came actually through a major blessing that took place in, in um, the conversion of Constantine in 312 A.D. Constantine, who was the emperor of Rome, became a Christian. And evidently, the conversion was genuine. And because of that conversion, he decided with the power that he held, which was significant, that he was going to turn Rome into a Christian nation. Now, I'm sure that when this happened, the Christians must have been beside themselves thinking, this is incredible. This is, uh, this is utopia. The whole world is now going to be affected by the gospel, and we've got the king. We've got the emperor of Rome on our side, and now we're no longer the underdog. We're the head, not the tail anymore, and th some things are going to change around here. You can imagine what that would be like. Well, uh, it's interesting that not everything that we think is good is always good despite the fact that, that Constantine gave many of the pagan temples to the church for worship, for corporate worship, and despite the fact that, that Emperor Constantine took it upon himself to build churches all across Rome and gave them as gifts to the church. And these were ornate, beautiful places. He was kind of like David and Solomon. They wanted to build something magnificent for God. So they built these really beautiful facilities and, they, and I'm sure Constantine is thinking, this is awesome. We're, we're honoring God. The church no longer is in hiding. They come out from the homes, and they run into these churches, and they're just like, this is for us, you know, a local congregation. And they're just beside themselves. And so they're, they're, they're in the churches. Who wants to go back to your, you know, your kind of humble home after that, you know? Who wants to be crowded and hot in a home when you've got this beautiful new facility? And so there was a major shift that began to take place. There was a transition from being persecuted to being accepted. Unfortunately, it led to compromise and to a lack of holiness because now it was popular to become a Christian and it didn't cost you anything to be a follower of Christ. They went from homes to buildings and the church became the centerpiece of the ministry. And so when people began to say church, they weren't thinking about people anymore. They were thinking about a location and bricks and mortar. They moved from laity, which means just normal people in the church, normal believers, to a clergy mentality, meaning that no longer was everyone a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but only the person who was in charge of that particular uh, venue, that particular church building. And so now you went from everyone participating in the ministry and lots of dialogue and lots of, of, of conversation and lots of corporate prayer and everybody having a part in these small little services in a home to now what we have now, which is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm speaking, and a lot of you people are listening. Some might be not listening. It's okay. I don't mind. But 
you've got this one to many. And, and in essence, even though you're actively listening, there's a passivity because uh, all the ideas that are being expressed right now are from me, which is very limiting because you guys have so much to share and, and so much wisdom and insight. But only one person is able to share in this environment. And they went from unpaid people doing ministry to paid clergy. And, and uh, it got so bad that uh, as corruption entered into the church through Constantine and through the whole system, uh, having a pastoral position kind of became a plum appointment, kind of like an ambassadorship somewhere. And so Constantine started pay, you know, uh, appointing people that really shouldn't have been appointed and, and receiving funds from people who would pay to get an appointment. And you can see how, how destructive that would be to the purity of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to the success of the ongoing ministry of the church. And the church went from being very participatory to very passive. And so just a handful of people, the worship people, the pastor, a handful of leaders do all the work, and everyone else just sits and listens and tries to absorb and tries to make application to their life. But the gifts of the Spirit, when you look at the New Testament, it's this, like it's this active participation. It's everyone has a word, everyone has a scripture, everyone has a song. And we're thinking, how do we do that, you know? Imagine if right now, like, 10 of you wanted to prophesy and five of you wanted to teach and a, a number of you wanted to sing a couple of new songs that you've learned and others wanted to give testimonies and you all just stood up at once and rushed the stage, you know? That's a real problem, but it's not a problem in a small setting. It's very possible. The church began to change and it actually uh, weakened significantly as a result of what they thought was this major blessing, the conversion of Constantine. Now, it doesn't mean that the conversion of, of a great well-known people can't be productive, but the fact is, is that it can't deter us from the model and the template that we have in the Bible and to find another way, a simpler way, a faster way, which is often what is the objective. There are a lot of limits on corporate worship, and I'll share these briefly. There's, there's limits on time. The time that you guys get to share and become friends with each other is limited to the time before the service, that minute and a half of greeting in the service, the little time of prayer that we had a few minutes ago uh, for the students, and then whatever time you give afterwards. Uh, fortunately, we have an incredible hospitality team. Can you guys just thank them? I, we don't do that often enough. They're, they're amazing. But they serve these incredible, delicious snacks for us that, that allow us to have something in our hand and a, and, a, and a refreshing drink or a cup of coffee or something, and to have this incredible fellowship that we get to enjoy as a church, but it's still so very, very limited. It limits the opportunity for connection. We can, we can have maybe one or two really meaningful conversations on a Sunday after church, or we have a lot of conversations that are very shallow. But it's hard to get much more than that. But, uh, but you can have that in a small group setting. It also limits our participation. The Bible tells us that we all have these gifts and abilities, but, but they aren't able to, we can't express those in a large corporate setting like this. And so these are some of the limitations. As a result, there is a call in our church, and I believe that it's, uh, it's, it's uh, becoming more apparent to churches across the nation and has for probably 10 or 15 years now, is that we really need a renaissance of this second wing of the church, which is small group ministry. It's something that's absolutely vital and critical. Renaissance means a, a rebirth. And, and it's really nothing new. We just have to go back to what the Bible actually said at the beginning. We got, we got sidetracked. We got derailed thinking that this is church. This is only part of church. The other part of church doesn't even happen here. It doesn't happen in this setting. I, um, I was really tickled. I, I like it when people say funny things to me about ministry, like, for instance, Jesus was so sneaky. I think it's great that we've got sneaky Jesus uh, jumping out of the tomb. Uh, I, I liked it one, one day when we were at uh, our family camp out at Naui, and there was this family of, I don't know, they have like 10 kids, 10 or 11, and, uh, and I was uh, having a sand fight down on the beach with the boys, and, and the little, little tiny guy, little tiny guys down here, and all the way to like 12 or so, and we were just going at it, and the littlest one uh, was trying to get my attention, and he couldn't remember my name, and he couldn't remember how to say pastor, and he couldn't remember any of that, so suddenly I just hear somebody yell out, hey, church boy, and it's like, <laughs> that's my kind of man, I love that, I totally love that, so there's this lady standing in line, 
And uh, she's over by the hospitality. She's a new believer. I think she came to Christ through our Coconut Festival outreach one year. And uh, she, she immediately got plugged into a small group. And as a result of being in the group, she was making friends. She was growing. She was being discipled. She was learning about her faith. Uh, she was learning about the love of Christ. I mean, she was just on cloud nine. And she's telling me about all this. And, and, uh, and as she's saying it all and so excited, uh, as she kind of said something that she didn't really intend to say, but I thought it was hilarious. She said, you know, I want to tell you, I love your sermons, I love your teaching, but if I had to choose between you and the small group, I'd take the small group any day. And I was like, and people were like, oh, you know, you shouldn't say that, you know. It's like, and I'm like, what are you talking about? She's absolutely right. She's absolutely right. Because what happens, it's the same for me. I'll be honest with you, when I was a younger Christian, there were times that I just couldn't wait until the talking head was done. That's the truth. I'm being honest. And maybe some of you feel that way. I'm not offended by that. Um, but there's something powerful about the relationships that happen in a church. It's not one or the other. It's both and. And so to miss out on all the, the small group activity part of it is to only have one wing as a Christian. And that, I think it's a part of the re reason a lot, of, a lot of us and sometimes a lot of churches are kind of weak is that we, we, we have this one hour, one and a half hours on a Sunday morning, and it's over, and that's it. And then we're trying to maintain ourselves all week long by ourselves with no real deep fellowship, no worship, no contact, no love, no, no connection with other people that are on fire for Christ, no one talking to us about what God's doing in their life. And we get worn down, and then we come kind of dragging in on Sunday morning, and we want to get kind of pumped up again. But you know, when I think about what God has planned and the benefits of small group, I just can't say enough about it, except I am going to say some more right now. Um, I'm going to tell you just a few things uh, fairly quickly. The benefits of small groups, it helps us to connect and build meaningful relationships. It's part of our DNA. It's part of the design of God that he's made us to be beings like him who crave and love and desire fellowship and connection. That's in us. Uh, some of us have learned how to deny that by uh, the fact that we've been hurt, we've been offended, we've been wounded, we've been betrayed, and we've kind of put up a wall and said, never again. And we wall ourselves in. And all I can tell you is that that is not the will of God for any Christian. It's not the will of God. So if you've done that, God's plan for you is to, is to brick by brick remove all that stuff and bring you to a place where you can experience this incredible joy of being uh, in the context and in the presence of other men and women who love you, care for you, who you love and care for, and are following Jesus Christ. Um, Larry Osborne said this. Uh, he's got a, a, a book that he called Sticky Church, and the idea is that, you know, how do you get people to stick? And he said this, "'Close and lasting friendships are the stickiest thing any church has to offer.'" They beat hands down great programming, great preaching, or most amazing dog and pony show ever. Yet very few churches spend time or energy helping people develop truly sticky relationships. We assume they'll just happen. That's a big mistake to assume that relationships will happen, especially for people that are here for the first time at church. They need us. They need us to, to let them know. Not overwhelm them, but they need us to let them know that they matter to us and that we care about them and that we're glad that they're here. The other thing is that it really promotes spiritual growth and discipleship because you can, um, you can practice, you can ask questions in a small group setting, you can get clarification. You'll learn a lot more, to be honest with you, by speaking what you're learning from God than by listening to me tell you what I've learned from God. That's just the truth about teaching and about sharing. It's, uh, it's an opportunity to love others, to respect one another, to be vulnerable, it's a safe and non-threatening place to learn how to, how to worship, how to use the gifts of the Spirit, how to, how to share your faith. It's just a, it's a great environment for all of those things, a great place for growth. It's a great place for facilitating the care of every believer because in a small group setting, instead of me or a handful of us on the church staff trying to care for all of you guys and all of your families and extended families, we've got a lot of people in our church who know how to do that. And the result is, is that I really don't do a lot of counseling for our church. It's not that I'm not available, and it's not that I'm not trained to do that. It's that so much of it happens on a grassroots level of people just being friends with each other. Most people don't need a therapist. They need some friends. They really don't need a therapist. 
They need friends. Now, some people need counseling. Some people have been through really horrific things, and they need guidance and help to navigate their way. But most people need friendship, and the small group offers that. It's great for prayer, it's great for encouragement, and it's a great place to bear each other's burdens and to love one another. It's also a great place uh, to develop meaningful accountability. Accountability is really important in anything. Any, any person that's endeavoring to experience transformation of any kind, we need accountability. We need somebody else alongside of us saying, don't give up, you can do this, and, uh, and I'm with you, and I'm praying for you. I can't offer that to all of you. I wish I could. I know so many of you so well, and I call a lot of you, especially the leaders. I, tr I probably make 30 or 40 phone calls every week just encouraging, praying for different people in the church, but I can't call everybody. It's just not possible. But if I'm doing that, and I've got 50 other people in the church that are doing that, or 100 other people doing that, and we're all caring for each other, suddenly it's like, wow, we could just call a couple of people. Everybody could call and care for a couple of people in our church, and nobody would be tired or burned out, and everybody's needs would be fully met and satisfied. It also facilitates the discovery of an exercise of spiritual gifts. I was telling the church last night that um, shortly after I... I committed my life to Christ when I was 17 and uh, went, ended up in San Diego going to school, returned to Hawaii, found myself in a Bible study uh, that was two blocks from my house where I had led my sister to Christ and then I wanted to invite her. She didn't have a car. And uh, so I invited her to this study because it was a two-block walk. And I said, I, we can do that. So I took her to this church. I ended up getting hired by that church later. It was a Calvary Chapel. But I took her to the church and to the pastor's house where there was a small Bible study. And as they had the Bible study, she loved it. I loved it. And then something happened in my heart that uh, I'd had happened before, but not very often. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was working in my heart and to give a prophecy. And I was, like, really nervous because I didn't even know these people that well. And uh, I'd been a couple of times to the study, and the Holy Spirit was telling me to say during the time of worship that that guy over there, his name was Tim, at, uh, I was going to say Tim at the time, it's still Tim, uh, his name is Tim, and, uh, and the Holy Spirit told me to tell Tim that he was going to be ordained as a pastor, and that God was going to raise him up in ministry and put him in full-time ministry. And I was like nervous, you know, you know those moments where the Holy Spirit speaks to you, what if I'm wrong, you know? What, you know, what if, what if I'm completely off base? Maybe, maybe he's not the right guy. And the Holy Spirit just kept saying, say it, say it, say it. And so um, they finished the worship, and they were kind of preparing to make a transition to the teaching, and I raised my hand kind of a little sheepishly, and I said, I, I feel like God has told me to say something. And they said, okay, we'll say it, you know. And they said, Tim, you're Tim, right? Yeah, God told me during the worship time that you're going to be a pastor and that you're to be ordained and that you'll be in full-time ministry. And I was just, that was like, and everybody was quiet, you know, I was just like silence, and I was like, ugh. <laughs> and, the, and the pastor that was there, Bill, uh, immediately stepped in, and he said, he said, God put that very same word on my heart during the time of worship, but God, the Spirit, told him that someone else was going to speak first, and he was to let them speak first. And you know, that could have never happened in a large group setting. You can imagine what that did to me, it was like, wow, the Holy Spirit used me. I was so excited. Do you, do you think it would have helped the pastor if he'd been the guy? Probably not. I mean, he'd be like, oh, that was really great. But for me, it was like life-changing that the Holy Spirit actually said something to me, and, and I got it right. That was prophecy. That, that couldn't have happened in a large group setting. So the exercise of the gifts and kind of trying to figure it out, because you're going to make mistakes with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but as you exercise that in a small group setting, you can do it, and you can make a mistake and be like, oh, that probably wasn't quite right, but this part was awesome, you know? And uh, it's not like we're trying to refine those, but we are. We're, we're, we're learning how to hear the voice of God and the Spirit of God. That can happen in a small group setting. It creates an, an environment where multifaceted options are available. So instead of everybody in the church being on the same page, going through the same book or the same questions in small groups, we give people total freedom that are leaders in our church. Do whatever you want. Make sure the word's involved, make sure worship's involved, and make sure prayer's involved. You want to lead an in-depth Bible study on Leviticus? Go for it. You want to lead an in-depth Bible study on, on child rearing? Do that. You want to take a group hiking once a month and make it an outreach of the church and invite unbelievers and have a little devotional and a testimony at the beginning? Do that. Whatever you want to do. We've got a group that's going to be teaching self-defense to women. I don't know why, but it's like one of the most popular Bible studies we've got in the church. Uh, the women love kicking the uh, volunteer man around like a rag doll. They just love doing that. 
I, I don't know what it is, but it's like they got boxing gloves and everything, and they learn how to defend themselves, but there's a Bible study associated with it, and it's just like, go for it, you know? And it's exciting. There's just so many different things that can be used by God, things that we are trained in, things that we're skilled at, that we can incorporate into this incredible fabric of the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It opens the door for evangelism by making it a non-threatening environment to invite friends. It encourages leadership, growth, and development because people get a chance to lead. The pastor isn't there. The, the key leaders aren't there. They might be one of the leaders, but they might not be. And it gives people a chance to teach, to lead worship that might not be qualified to be up here, but they can do it in a small group setting. That's where people grow. It's just amazing what can happen. It's, it's a training and proving ground for people to be able to find out what their gifts are. And, uh, and then it certainly expands the reach and impact of the corporate church because we're not limited by this facility. We're at a place now where we're, we're having scheduling problems trying to figure out how to use this facility and, and meet all the needs that are represented by all the people that want to do ministry here. And this is just our church. We're like, we've run out of days and nights and mornings. We just hardly have any more time for anything here. It needs to go to the homes. It needs to go to the community. And there are no limits in that, in that regard. And the last thing that's amazing is that small group uh, fellowships allow and permit and actually facilitate the planting of churches, which I believe is, the, is probably the most effective way to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ is through church planting. And we raise people up in our church, and we've planted three churches so far, and we want to keep planting churches. So every time we hit about 400 people or so, we want to send 100 of them out and help them get started with, uh, with the new church. And we just keep doing that and then keep growing and keep doing it and keep growing because as we're doing that, in small group settings, people learn the skill sets and they have the vision and the heart and the calling and suddenly they have the opportunity to be able to not just watch somebody do all this, but they get to do it themselves. And God stirs up their heart and they say, I'd like to do this more. I'd like to see if God might have a plan for me to, to be used in this regard. And so I, I just, um, I don't know if you've kind of picked up on it. I, I really like God a lot. Uh, even Sneaky Jesus, I think, is absolutely awesome. And um, I, th I think the church is glorious. I think the bride, you, the body of Christ, are, are stunning, amazing, a, a work of art. You're not finished. I'm not finished. But that's one of the beauties of the body of Christ is that we can love each other, care for each other, have each other's backs, spur each other on, even sometimes correct and rebuke each other when necessary teach each other, model the Christian life, witness to people in the community, let other people be a part of this. I mean, there's just, there's no end to what God can do with the man or woman that's available. And that's why he says in 2 Chronicles 16, 9, that the eyes of the Lord are ranging throughout the earth to support those whose hearts are fully devoted to him. I pray he'd find that in this church. I think he has, but it's not something that we can rest on. We can't say, I, I used to be available to God. We need to be able to say that every day. God, I'm available. I'm ready and willing. Small groups, large corporate worship, the whole thing blended together, the perfect work of God. Be a part of it. Enter into it. We're going to have um, small groups and their leaders at the back of the church. In fact, would, would you that are leading small groups, I think I asked you to do this. I can't remember. If I didn't, please forgive me, but would you come forward if you're a small group leader planning on leading a group or if you've led a group in the past uh, that, uh, that you, you've done, you're planning maybe doing another one in the future. If you're leading a group, we weren't even a part of the training recently, but you've been leading a group, would you come up front? I want people to see who you are because we're going to pray for you. So you have to kind of do it quickly. Just stand right up here. We're going to pray for all of these men and women. And that would include the, uh, why don't the staff of the Bible College come up too because you're, you're leading uh, your own small group, your Ohana as well. And uh, we want to pray for all these men and women. Come right up here. Just come, come right up on this, the green part of the stage and we'll pray for you. These men and women are, are really outstanding. We've got more of them than aren't here because a number of them are teaching in Sunday school right now. Uh, but these are men and women that have uh, evidenced the capacity to teach, to lead. Uh, they've been trained. They've got a heart for God. They have under shepherd's heart. They're not just people that want to have a Bible study and, and, uh, uh, and do something. These are people that want to care for the people in the church, for you guys, and have made themselves available for that purpose. They're leading the, the, the variety. I don't even want to, I can't even get started on the variety here. The, the variety of people and the groups they're leading are just as, as unusual as you can imagine. It's just amazing the, the, 
the beauty of what God has done in them and now is going to do through them. They're going to have tables at the back of the service after the service where you can, they can introduce themselves to you, you to them. Uh, you can find out what group they're leading. You can sign up for different groups that you might be interested in being a part of so they can contact you, put, a, put you on their mailing list for their particular group because these groups are going to be starting in some cases in the next week or two, and you can be a part of that. So these are, these are the men and women of this semester that are going to be leading. Could you just thank them for their investment in what they're doing? So I, I want to take a minute to pray for them, and then we'll close our service. Father, thank you for these wonderful men and women who are making themselves available to serve the body of Christ. God, they, they, they have the same challenges that everyone else has. They've got a job. They've got uh, bills. They've got family. Uh, they've got challenges. They've got disappointments and struggles. They've got things that aren't complete in their life. And in spite of all of that, Lord, they're making themselves available to reach out. They're making themselves available to care for others. They're making themselves available to under-shepherd your flock in your name. And God, when I read the Bible, I'm just reading through Ezekiel recently and how much you love your flock and how upsetting it is to you when, when your shepherds don't take care of your flock and how blessed you are when they do. And Father, these men and women love your flock, and we have so many men and women in this church that love your flock, your people, and God, I pray that you'd favor them and bless them. I pray that you'd stir up the hearts of all of us to be involved in some sort of small group this semester, and that our hearts would be transformed and changed, and you'd begin to heal us and strengthen us and make us a force to be reckoned with, as we talked about earlier, for your kingdom, for your glory, as we hold out the blessed hope of the glory of Christ, the mystery now revealed in the resurrected saving Lord Jesus Christ. And so, God, we want to say thank you for this epic journey that you have us on. Bless us as we endeavor to love you, to receive your love and your grace, to walk in the holiness and the purity of your spirit, but also the power of your spirit, to live this life you've called us to with utter abandon and joy in the midst of it as we fall in love with you and love one another. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.